by works, so that no one can boast. The people of God know that if you are looking to Christ in repentance and faith, it's not what you have done, but what He has done that assures you of complete and full forgiveness of sins. And He sets you free from the fear of the devil. God's people said, Thanks be to God. Amen. God's will for our lives is one verse, and it follows immediately after that we are saved by grace, and it's not by works. It says this in verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do. We are saved by grace and then strengthened by the Spirit to go and be salt, to be light, and to bear the fruit of the Spirit as His forgiven and loving children. Amen. Let's celebrate God's filling of our lives with His grace, 547, 547, great number.
looking at how do we include the culture? What does Christian culture look like in the midst of the culture we see around us? And we're going to be looking at the book of Malachi for these four Sundays. Before we read, let us pray. Holy Spirit, you inspired the prophet Malachi, along with all the other prophets and apostles, to write down your word, that we might not be left in the dark, but might know you by your own revelation. But your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Your word is living and active. Cutting deep. We pray, Lord, that your word would transform us. We would not merely be informed, but might be made more and more like Christ. So we put our faith in you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Now, by one, we're going to look at the first five verses. An oracle. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, the Lord says? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have turned his mountains into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. is 
really, you could say, the context of Malachi's prophecy. The people of God wait, unsure of when they would ever get to their destination. Wondering, is it worth it? Is it worth trusting this God whose promises just keep going further and further down the road and we don't see the answers? See, it was around 539 B.C. when King Cyrus of the Persians had the edict that the Jews in exile could go home to Israel and rebuild the temple. 539. In around 515, 25 years later, 24 years later, the people of Israel had finally finished building the temple. That was the context, if you remember, the, of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, encouraging the people to, to rebuild, to continue, encouraging that God was going to restore the people. Prophecies about the, the high priest Josiah being purified by God. Prophecies about Zerubbabel, the, the ruler, the governor, being set in a place of authority, God's signet ring. That's 515. It was about 458. Almost a hundred. It's hard to make math backwards. It, generation or two later that Ezra comes, bringing some more priests. And 445, when Nehemiah comes, the first time. Now if you look at the book of Nehemiah, you'll notice that Nehemiah comes, but then in chapter, I think it's 10, I should have looked at it. It's between chapters 10 and 13 that Malachi preaches. Nehemiah leaves, and then he comes back and finds Israel just in shadows. He finds the Israelite men marrying pagan women and worshiping their gods. He finds children of the Israelites born who don't even know how to speak Hebrew. They're speaking the tongues of the, the foreigners. He finds the, the, the temple being neglected. The priests have left. To go work their farms because they need food. Because nobody's giving it to the priest. Nobody's providing for the, the upkeep of the temple. The sacrifices are pathetic. It's a way to get rid of your coals instead of the best. We know that from Nehemiah. We don't know the date specifically of Malachi other than it was after the exile. And most of his prophecies line up with the situation that Nehemiah found when he returned. It was very likely that Malachi was preaching, prophesying around 430 B.C. Just under a hundred years after the people of Israel could come back. For 80 years after Haggai and Zechariah had promised that God was going to restore Israel and give them blessing again. And now the people of Israel and Malachi, they are standing there looking around. And just to give you some perspective, the province of Judah, during the time of Nehemiah, Ezra, and Malachi, was a piece of land about 20 miles long by 30 miles wide, with maybe 150,000 people. It was pathetic compared to the kingdom of David. It was pathetic compared to the kingdom of Solomon. This one commentator I read put it, it was the undersized post-exilic rump steak 
state, not state, but state of Judah. They were the Levites. They hadn't seen the restoration promised by Haggai. They hadn't seen the promised restoration by Zechariah. And so they find themselves in this spot wondering, what's going on? Is God going to keep his promises to us? Does God really love us? As we see, when you look through the rest of Malachi, it was a time of glowing air. When it wearied the priests and the people to bring their sacrifices, as we see in chapter 1, verse 13 of Malachi, where the people of God deem it irrelevant to do good or evil in the eyes of the Lord, as we see in chapter 2, verse 17. And where they saw it as futile to serve him, as we see in chapter 3, verse 14. See, if we live in a state where we are perpetually questioning, does he not love us? Is he ever going to fulfill these promises? That leads to a change in the way we live. See, doubting God's love long term, questioning His love long term leads us to live like He does. It leads to laxity in worship and sacrifice. It leads to self centeredness in relationships rather than God centered. <laughs> could say in some ways the church today is in a pretty similar state to the people of Israel in Malachi's time. I mean, it is 2,000 years after Jesus came and said he'd return again. And when we look around and it seems like the church is shrinking in our area, and then it's getting lax. It seems like it's a struggle, and where are the benefits? We look around and we wonder. I like how Michael Card, the songwriter, put it. He said this, We were created to live with God in a garden, yet we wake every morning in the desert of the fallen world. And we wonder when. When are you going to make everything new like you promised? When? And if that's the only thing we allow ourselves to focus on, if we just ask and doubt and wonder, we're going to start living like he does. Just like the people of Israel kind of fallen into during this time. But God doesn't leave his people in that state. He comes to them. He sends them the prophet Malachi with proof of God's love. I have loved you. Equally well, you could try to say, I love you. The reason most translators yet they put the I have loved you is to emphasize that this is a continuous love. I have loved you in the past and I continue to love you today. We can see the, the, the state of the Israelites' relationship right in response to this. I mean, if you have a husband and wife and husband says to his wife, I love you. And they respond, how have you loved me? You know you've got some issues to work with in your relationship. But apparently, you could say that was the vibe Malachi was picking up on the street when he was preaching. The people of Israel were asking, well, how does God love us? How do we know? And God's answer kind of shocks us. Basically 
says, I loved you. Esau, I've hated. And then explains how Esau has been hated as evidence that God has loved Israel. How does that work? What kind of answer is that? Well, if you look at verse 3 in particular, if you look at the, the second half of that verse, Esau I hated, I turned his mountains into a wasteland, left his inheritance to the desert jackals, and then God promises that they may try to rebuild, but I'm going to destroy. Just compare Jeremiah chapter 9. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 9 and read verse 11. Jeremiah is prophesying against Israel before the exile. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals. I will lay waste the towns of Judah so no one can live there. That sounds pretty similar to what Malachi is saying to about these people of Edom. What's the difference, though? Here's the difference. Jeremiah also proffered, prophesied a restoration to Israel. Seventy years you'll be in exile, and then you'll come back. God would discipline Israel, destroying Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, but he would bring the people of God back and restore them. And here in Malachi we find the opposite for Edom. He's going to wipe them out. There are no Edomites today. The Edomites never received prophets like Malachi to call them back. The prophets never the, the Edomites never received prophets saying, you will be restored. They never received prophets, you will return to the land. The Edomites did not receive mercy. Now, if saying to Israel, I love you, and proof of it is I hated Esau, you can say that it's a negative display of love, which is an odd thing for us to think about. But if you stop and think about it, mercy is a negative display of love. Mercy is different than grace. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. So it's negative. God's holding back something. Grace is positive. It's getting what you do not deserve. And here, to encourage the people of Israel who had received the promises, who had received the prophets, who were waiting and wondering, he reminds them that you have promises, they don't. I have called you. I have elected you. Paul turns to this passage in Romans chapter 9 when he talks about God's electing the love. And what we need to grasp here is that election and covenant fit together. Election is God's eternal decree. Choosing those to be saved and passing over the others. Coming into relationship with those who are going to be saved. And rejecting the others. Covenant is the working out in history. God's eternal election. Covenant
covenant is God working in history to, to bring His people to Himself through the people of Israel, through Jesus Christ, through the church. Into relationship with Him as He has eternally ordained before the foundation of the world, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul, Malachi is here telling Israel to look back at covenant history. Look how God has been working. Yes, you have been disciplined, but this isn't surprising. Remember what the prophet Amos said. Amos 3 verse 2. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you. For all your sins. Yes, Israel, I've gave the same prophecy to you through Jeremiah that I'm saying about the Edomites here through Malachi. But you received as a child being corrected back to me. Edom receives it as due consequence for living without God. See, we have to. This phrase, Esau I have hated. How do we understand that? Especially in the light of a Bible passage like Deuteronomy, chapter 23, where God's laying out who can come into the assembly of the Lord, who can worship God. And we read this in Deuteronomy 23, verse 7. Do not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Do not hate them. And it goes on to say this in verse 8. The third generation of children born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. And that gives us a clue to why does God hate Esau? Now having just come from Romans chapter 5 a couple Sundays ago, the reason God hates Esau is because he's in Adam. And he's not in Christ. Hey, wait a second, wait a sec. The, the, the Jews didn't know Christ. No, but they knew the promise ahead that the Christ would come. They were saved in Christ in the future. Just as we are saved in Christ because of his work in the past. In Adam, every one of us are hated. Jacob and Esau did nothing to earn God's love. They both equally deserved God's wrath. But God put his promise on Jacob. See, God committed himself to Jacob and his descendants, leading up to Christ. And now all who put their faith in Christ. See, if covenant love is a determined, devoted commitment, a relationship, covenant hatred, like we see here described from Esau, is the absence of any commitment to relationship. And that's where we human beings are in our We've rejected God. We have the wrath of God coming down on us justly. God says, I'm going to turn your mountains into a wasteland and the inheritance of the desert jackals. And this was happening as Malachi preached. It was right around the 400s where the Edomites were pushed out of their land by the Nadabian Arab tribes who way overgrazed it and destroyed it. They turned it into a desert. He would never went back. But we can see this in our day too. Where to live without God leads to destruction. We look around our own society and we see their views of human sexuality. And they say, you do whatever you want. And the only rule is have consent. And we see 
not the dignification of image bearers of God made as men and women. Rather, when we see people being destroyed by their confusion about their own identity, by their demeaning nature of pornography and serial relationships. We see to live without God leads to destruction. We see it in the very nature of our, our political discourse where people without God deify their party, their position, and demonize the other. And civil discourse just gets worse and worse. Without God, society implodes. It is destroyed. It may succeed in getting power for a while like Soviet communism did. It will be brought down. It will be demolished by God. This is the nature of being in Adam as opposed to being in Christ as the Israelites were. And we need to see the destruction of the wicked as evidence that God loves his people. As a reason to say great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. We may struggle like the Israelites do, waiting, wondering, when on earth is Jesus going to come again? But what Malachi is reminding us is that we are not to judge God's love for us by our circumstances, saying, oh well, I'm dealing with cancer, God must not love me. I lost my job, God must be mad at me for some reason. My relationships are falling apart. What did I do to tick him off? He doesn't love me. That's backwards. What Malachi is telling us here is we need to start with a position that God has promised, I love you in Jesus Christ. And use that to interpret the trials and the waiting that we endure. It's normal for us to doubt. It's normal for us to wonder. We see that in Psalm 73. The psalm is, my foot almost slipped when I envy the prosperity of the wicked. They don't have any troubles. But then we get to the middle of Psalm 73. And the psalmist enters the sanctuary of God and is reminded. God's promises. Of God's covenant relation to his people and how those in Adam will be destroyed. They are the ones whose feet will slip. And in Christ we stand secure. We will not fall. Though they kill us, though they kill our bodies, they cannot kill our soul. Israel was to look to Esau as a reminder of God's love and the wrath Esau was experiencing as opposed to the discipline they were experiencing. We today are invited to look to the cross of Jesus Christ where we see the hatred, the wrath of God being poured out for our sins. We are invited to look to the empty tomb where Jesus was raised from the dead for our justification. We're invited to look to the history, the historical accounts we find in the Gospels. And be reminded that Jesus truly lived and died and rose again. And we have it on good authority. We ought not to 
question the reliability of the Gospels. The Gospels, this book, is one of the most solidly, it is the most solidly tested too in manuscripts through the ages. It hasn't changed like in a telephone game from one year to the next. It is reliable. It is true. And so just like those children struggling to get to the end of that road trip, need to be reminded of what's at the destination and that it's worth it and continuing persevering. We too, in our lives here, whatever ups or downs we are struggling with, whatever trials we may be facing, we need to remember. We need to remind each other of what is the destination. Where is God's covenant love taking? His promises. And we need to remember them in the light of Numbers 23, verse 9, I think. Is God a man that he should lie? That he should say something and not do it? God gave Esau and the Edomites his evidence. That apart from Christ, we're destined for wrath. But here's a little interesting tidbit. The prophet Amos, look to the last chapter of Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Amos prophesies about Israel's restoration. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken pieces, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name. So David's tent's restored, and David's tent possesses the remnant of Edom. I said there's no more Edomites today. But when the Nadabian Arabs pushed the Edomites out of their land, they ended up south of Jerusalem in a province called Idumea. Herod was the Idumean. And we read this in Mark chapter 3, verse 8. So, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. And a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard that all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Some of those Edomites who were under the wrath of God like every other human being in Adam, came to Christ and found themselves moved to the God, covenant of God's love or discovering that they were in it. Maybe it's a better way to put it. That they were in Christ. They were no longer under God's wrath. Our eyes are often unable to perceive the people's hearts. And so what we're to do is to invite others to come and see Jesus. To come and look at what God's covenant love does. To come and reflect on what the effect of God's covenant hatred is apart from Christ. And invite them to put their faith in Jesus as well. Let us remember what God has done. Let us respond. Not, how have you loved us? But I love you, Lord. Jesus, thank you. Let's pray. God Almighty, great are you.
for extending the tent of David to incompetence, even us Gentiles who look to Jesus in faith for bringing us into your covenant love. Lord, I pray that each one of us here would rest in Christ, would allow your covenant love to shape the way we view our lives. in Christ's death and resurrection. Almighty, oh, thank you for not leaving us under your wrath, but sending Jesus Christ to bear your wrath against our sin that we might be set free for all eternity in your family. In Jesus' name we pray. We're struggling to wait. We need to remind ourselves and pray for that closer walk with God to, as we remember 551, 551 in the great year.
commentary wasn't so intense and divisive. In the midst of it all, Lord, we thank you for the stability of Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful in the midst of it all, not to grow weary and lose heart, but to speak your words truthfully and lovingly. Lord, we pray for those members of ours who are sick, here with us, for the in quarantine or not, we pray that you would encourage them to give them health and strength. We pray for those who are unable to join us. We pray that you would speak to them by your word, give them a taste of the fellowship of believers. We, we love them and long to meet with them again. God, may we pray for your church as it gathers around the globe today. It gathers in various situations with the threat of persecution, lockdown, the threat of threat of execution or jail. And they gather in secrecy on a normal basis. We pray that you would encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ in countries like North Korea, Iran. You would strengthen them through your word. You would enable them to persevere. And Lord, we pray that we might see their example be spurred upon. That we might avoid apathy, but and cultivate a hunger for your word, a hunger to live for you and witness to you in this world. But it is so easy for us to grow focused on ourselves, broaden our vision. But we pray for those affected by the wildfires out west, those fighting the fires, those who have lost homes or businesses, those who have lost lives, family members. We pray for rain, snow in the mountains to put the fires out. We pray for those recovering from the hurricane, the other natural disasters we've experienced. Lord, we thank you for the rain that is water the dry earth. God, Father, we pray for our nation as we come closer to a, a presidential election. We pray for the ability to be salt and light as we talk about politics. Lord, might we be prophetic as Christians, not partisan. Might we apply the sharp edge of your word and truth to everyone we have seen, to all politic, political parties and politicians, encouraging them wherever we find alignment with your truth challenging them and pointing them to the truth where they are not aligned with your word. God, I might pray that you would protect us from idolizing the results of elections. We pray that you would help us to, to be faithful and to trust you and to work hard that your truth might advance. Is remembering that the result is in your hands, not ours. God, our Father, we pray for our missionaries. We pray that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them in their service. 
Giffords of Mexico City, Hi Joel and Jimmy Heiser in Texas, his work around the globe. The Vander Walls and the Lemahues is there on home service here in the States from away from Papua New Guinea for this time. We pray that we provide for them, encourage them, help them as they seek to raise support. We give them refreshment and joy. Heavenly Father, as we take an offering today, we thank you for the work of gems and cadets. These organizations that seek to, to raise up godly men, young men, young women, that they might know and love you and be future leaders of the church. We pray that our offering would be a blessing to these organizations and help them to increase in their effectiveness in their ministry. We thank you for them. We thank you for our cadets and our gems here at this church, counselors and the boys and the girls. We pray that you would keep, give them health, bless their time together. Might they grow to love you more and more through the fun they have together, through the study of their words, through the development of their skills and talents. We pray for our Sunday school program. So the students and the teachers start meeting today. But may this time be effective as we seek to keep the promises we made at baptism. To help each other raise up these children in the way they should go to know about Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. God's people say. Amen. We prepare to go out. I want you to turn to 322. God, the Father of your people. 322. <laughs>